My name is Catherine Alexander, and I'm a professor of Chinese in the Department of Asian Languages and Civilization here at CU Boulder. And my research focuses on literature from China, and also a little bit of literature and history and culture from Taiwan as well. I was born in Taiwan, and so I grew up there speaking Taiwanese and Mandarin Chinese um, from the time I was basically learning how to talk. And um, I spent, you know, most of my childhood moving back and forth between the U.S. and Taiwan. When I finally got to college in the U.S., which was my first time living more than like a year in the U.S., um, I realized that it would be a really big waste if I didn't somehow use both my language skills and like my cross-cultural abilities. What I realized pretty early on in college is that I really like literature. Um, I love stories. I love how stories are an integral part of our understanding of other cultures, right? When like when you want to tell somebody about another place, you could tell them facts or you could tell them a story and like immerse them in the spot, right? Immerse them in that place and culture and time. And so I just got really enamored of the idea that I could read novels from China from the 16th and 17th centuries. That's like really what drew me in in college was um, the novels, the plays, like getting involved in like kind of like contemporary culture of a different era and a different time. So the research that I do, that I publish on, that I'm working on a book project on, has to do with the place of religious popular literature in China during and after a major civil war in the middle of the 19th century. So I'm looking at texts that were either written during that period or had been written you know, maybe 100 or 200 years ago but kind of became popular again during that period which were meant to be read aloud and performed by like a storyteller so that a group of people who maybe couldn't even read could still like get the message, right? Like a sermon type message. Um, and thinking about how that kind of literature is part of a larger sense of reconstruction, right? Like during and after a war, you need to rebuild your infrastructure. You need to rebuild your population. You need to rebuild like the farms and like your economy. But you also need to rebuild like society and culture and sort of heart by heart sort of bring some kind of recovery. This semester I'm teaching three classes. I'm teaching uh, Intro to Chinese Civilization. The way that I teach it, I'm significantly more interested in more broad aspects of society. My research is meant to kind of consider people who are more broadly at the margins of society, right? Who might not be literate who probably haven't left their names for us in history, who we don't know their life stories. But like, I'm always curious about, well, if, even if we don't know their stories, how do we know what stories they were listening to? So I try to teach the course, not only based upon like what we have in the textbook from you know who are all the big deal people of history. We read primary sources in translation and think about like, how do we get other stories from those primary sources? How do we understand what else was going on. I'm teaching uh, Women and the Supernatural in Chinese Literature, which is incredibly fun, in part because I'm teaching a lot of the same texts that like drew me into the field. It just convinces me that they're even more rich than I had any idea when I was 19 reading them for the first time. My research being mostly on 19th century literature means that I'm not interviewing people, I'm not traveling to places to do field work. I'm not an anthropologist, right? I'm a scholar of literature. And so all of the people that I could interview are dead. I'm not always in front of a computer. Sometimes I'm in front of a book. <laughs> sometimes I'm taking notes in a notebook by hand. Um, sometimes I have to travel to find other books. <laughs> you know, some of the best days I've had of research have been when I've gone to like a library in China and started, you know, gone to the rare book collection or like the the restricted books collection and um, finding things that I didn't know were there. That's pretty exciting to me. Um, but the social aspects of research are pretty significant. There's no way to really do research that matters unless you're part of a conversation. 
And so keeping up on what are the conversations around my narrow field and what are the larger trends in um, the field overall of late imperial literary studies involves um, keeping up with my colleagues via email. Sometimes I have Skype meetings with them just to kind of catch up on where we are. I go to conferences. What you can do at a conference um, replicates a little bit of what you get to do in grad school, which is to bounce an idea off of a bunch of really, really smart people and see what kind of feedback you get. The actual act of research is looking at all of those kinds of conversations, looking at all those issues and saying, well, what can I add here, right? There seems to be a little bit of a gap. There's a question I have that I can't find the answer to yet. And, you know, taking that moment and like being empowered to say, well, you know what, maybe I can find the answer to that question, or at least get us another step towards that kind of answer. That's really, I think, the most fun part of research overall, um, is diving into something getting really, really confused, and then starting to figure out how to put the puzzle pieces together into a picture that no one's seen yet. I think the biggest thing that I've noticed when I'm teaching is that a lot of students seem really afraid to admit that they don't know things. The thing is that all research starts from not knowing something. Right? We go into a problem and we're like, this really doesn't make sense. And the fact that it doesn't make sense is actually a really good thing. Because it means that you have a place to start from. Right? It means that you're curious enough to say, wow, I really don't know about X, Y, or Z. Let me figure this out some more. If I could get more students to ask more questions in class, that would already be the best start for them in terms of research, right? For me, there's sort of two or three steps to research, and one of them is reading broadly enough to kind of know, in general, the area that I want to work in. And then reading really, really narrowly, really, really closely for the things that I think are probably worth studying. I can identify things that are weird things that don't fit the pattern I've already established. And that pattern that you kind of develop through lots of background research is where you start to see where the pattern shifts and where your questions come up.